Good morning. Welcome to our worship service this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, and a special welcome to any visitors that we have with us. We're glad to have you here and invite you to come and be with us again. We also welcome those who join us uh, for our worship service out in the cars via our FM broadcast. We're glad to have you join us for worship. A reminder that our services are video recorded and are accessible through the church website when they are uh, posted early this coming week. want to call your attention to the announcements that are in the bulletin. Uh, we want to remember to keep Glenn Spies' family in your prayers. Also, um, you have, may have heard that Andre Delacroix uh, died yesterday. And so we keep Sandy and uh, Terry and the rest of the family in prayers at this time of their loss as well. We continue in the church year with the 8th Sunday after Pentecost as we hear of the growth of God's kingdom and our call as disciples and followers of Jesus to live in that kingdom. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Praise and thanks to you, holy God, for by your word you made all things. You spoke light into darkness, called forth beauty from chaos, and brought life into being. For your word of life, O God, by your word you called your people Israel to tell of your wonderful gifts freedom from captivity, water on the desert journey, a pathway home from exile, wisdom for life with you. For your word of life, O God, through Jesus, your word made flesh, you speak to us and call us to witness forgiveness through the cross, life to those entombed by death, the way of your self-giving love. For your word of life, O God, send your spirit of truth, O God, rekindle your gifts within us, renew our faith, increase our hope, and deepen our love for the sake of a world in need. Faithful to your word, O God, draw near to all who call on you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Let us pray. Faithful God, most merciful judge, you care for your children with firmness and compassion. By your spirit, nurture us who live in your kingdom, that we may be rooted in the way of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Luther's small catechism, the Ten Commandments, the conclusion to the commandments. What then does God say about all these commandments? God says the following, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. What does this mean? God threatens to punish all who break these commandments. Therefore, we are to fear his wrath and not disobey these commandments. However, God promises grace and every good thing to all those who keep these commandments. Therefore, we also are to love and trust him and gladly act according to his commands. The King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Who is like me? Let them proclaim it. Let them declare and set it forth before me. Who has announced from of old the things to come? Let them tell us what is yet to be. Do not fear or be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God beside me? There is no other rock, I know not one. Here ends the reading. We will read Psalm 86 responsibly. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Knit my heart to you that I may fear your name. I will thank you, O Lord my God, 
with all my heart and glorify your name forever. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the neithermost pit. The arrogant rise up against me, O God, and a band of violent men seeks my life that have not set you before their eyes. But you, O Lord, are gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and full of kindness and truth. Turn to me and have mercy upon me. Give your strength to your servant and save the child of your handmaid. Show me a sign of your favor so that those who hate me may see it and be ashamed. Because of you, O Lord, have helped me and comforted me. The second lesson is from the eighth chapter of Romans. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to, the, to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Here ends the reading. Please stand for the gospel. Alleluia. My word shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel lesson according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field, but while everyone was asleep, an enemy came and sowed seeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, no. For in gathering the weeds, you will uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him, 
saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. The tagline for the credit card company Capital One asks, What's in your wallet? You ever heard that one? The implication is that their credit card should be there. What we carry in our physical wallets can tell a lot about who we are as a person. Where you live, where or how you spend your money, organizations to which you belong, all of these can be determined by what is in your wallet. Similarly, in the parable of the weeds, it seems that Jesus is asking the crowd, what's in your spiritual wallet? Because Jesus says this parable is a comparison to the kingdom of God, we could say that this text is intended to serve as an advertisement for the kingdom of God. Today's gospel lesson is the second parable in Jesus' discourse that involves sowing seed. As with last week's parable of the sower, seed, and soil, Jesus tells the parable to the crowd and then explains the meaning of the parable privately to his disciples. In today's parable, a sower plants good seed in the field, but an enemy plants weeds that compete with the good crop. The two types of plants look the same when young, but as they mature, the workers note the differences between the two plants. They ask the owner sower if they should pull up the weeds, but the owner says to let them grow together in order to prevent the good crop from being damaged in the weeding process. The owner says that at harvest time the reapers will separate the good crop from the weeds. The good crop will be kept and the weeds will be burned. To his disciples, Jesus explains that he is the sower owner, the field is the world, and the good seed are the children of God's kingdom. The enemy is the devil and the weeds are children of the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, which is the day of Jesus' return to judge the living and the dead. And the reapers are angels. This parable raises up three things for us to note in our lives of faith. First is that evil in this world is persistent and we cannot escape its presence 
nor its effects. Additionally, the power and effects of evil can be subtle, almost indistinguishable from good. What looks good early on may turn out to be evil in the end. Jesus illustrated this in the parable by the young plants. The good wheat and the weeds, the weeds probably being Darnell, could not be identified as separate early on. This only became apparent later. Jesus says it is the devil who plants weeds in the field of the world. Scripture uses two terms for this source of evil. One is the devil, which means the tempter, the one who entices people away from God and God's ways. The other is Satan, meaning the adversary or accuser, the one who claims that God is not good and accuses him of not having the desire to save us. It started in the Garden of Eden. By this he is an adversary to God and the saving grace God desires for all. St. Paul echoes Jesus' statement of the power of the devil in the world. In Ephesians 6.12, Paul says, For our struggle is not against blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of the present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. What Paul is reiterating here is that we are in a constant battle with spiritual darkness, with Satan and the devil, who has captured some, and who would, if he gets his way, lead us away from life in God. And so the devil is subtle. So subtle that at times we do not distinguish his temptation and we get sucked in to conforming to sin. In 1939, Charles Lawton starred as Quasimodo in the movie The Hunchback of Notre Dame. In order to look the part, Lawton strapped himself into a harness that bent and distorted his back. The first few days he wore the harness, it didn't affect him much. But after weeks of wearing it, he discovered that when he took it off at night, he was having a harder time standing up straight. His spine was conforming to the harness. And it required much greater effort to stand up normally when he removed it. In the same way, because we cannot escape the presence of sin and evil in this world, we find ourselves conforming to it. We try to justify sin by redefining it, trying to convince ourselves Oh, it's really not that bad or destructive. We shrug our shoulders and say, Well, that's just the way the world works. We get so used to sinful patterns of behavior and distorted structures of groups and communities that we end up distorting our lives instead of living fully in our identity and relationships as children of God. It's so easy to compromise in order to go along and get along that we get sucked in by the devil and conform to ways of sin. But like the plants, as they mature, the differences show and the consequences of sin become apparent. Jesus in the parable states that in this age the persistence of evil will be with us. 
both good and evil will exist side by side. And we, as people of faith, are called to repent from and resist the evil we recognize in our lives and in our world. The reality of sin and evil being present in the world and the reality that we cannot escape their effects in our lives leads to the second point in the parable. The promise from Jesus that it will not always be this way. Jesus describes this in terms of the harvest. Angels will come to harvest both wheat and weeds. The good grain will be gathered into God's barn. But the weeds will be gathered into bundles and destroyed by fire. Note that it is God, the Son of Man, Jesus, who appoints the angels as reapers, who will do the separating and the judging. This can be a challenge for us. We too often decide to appoint ourselves as judges. Sometimes evil and its fruits are easy to distinguish. Anyone can see that some attitudes and actions are clear, clearly wrong and ungodly. But some things are not so clear. And we with limited knowledge and vision might judge wrongly or too harshly. Human judgment is limited. We simply cannot be certain who is in the kingdom of God and who is out. Thank God is not up to us to finally judge at the coming of Christ. As God told Samuel when he was looking over Jesse's sons to see which one would be chosen as king, God said it clearly. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. This is why it is good that we can leave the weeding and judging to God and the appointed angels. We can faithfully be about our mission as obedient and faithful disciples of Jesus, knowing that all will be set right by God in the end. The third point of the parable is one that Jesus calls to our particular attention by saying, let anyone with ears listen. This is the promise of our living in the kingdom of the Father forever. John told us at the beginning of his gospel that Jesus was the light of the world and that he, he came into the world to bring his holy light to all who would receive him. In the parable for today, Jesus promises that the righteous, those good seeds that are the children of the kingdom, will shine in this light. Jesus says they will shine like the sun in the kingdom. Pastor Dan Mangler tells of a special worship service that was planned a few years ago in a very old church in Israel. This church was maintained by a community of monks. It was such an old structure that it had no electricity. But this worship service was an important event and there were plans to broadcast the service on television and in fact the off an officer from the National Council of Churches would be helping to lead the service. A television crew came in and began setting up their film equipment, including a number of large lights. When they tested the lights, the monks <gasps> gasped. Unbeknownst to any of them, the ancient church had a beautiful mural painted on the ceiling. Centuries had passed without anyone knowing this work of beauty was hiding overhead. Only in the presence of the light was the beauty revealed. 
this revelation of light and beauty is what Jesus is alluding to as he talks about the righteous shining in the kingdom. It is the full and sure promise of God to the faithful. In the parable of the wheat and weeds, Jesus calls us to confront some facts about our lives of faith. One fact is that we cannot escape the presence and effects of sin and evil in the world. We may even be compromised by and participants in sin and evil unwittingly or by conforming to the systems and patterns that result from them. We are called to confess these and repent of them. I read a funny story about an elderly woman named Agatha Longworth who due to hearing loss had an uncomfortable habit of shouting her sins when she visited the confessional booth in her Catholic church. Her priest, Father Duncan, was concerned about her privacy and the sanctity of the confessional, so he suggested that she write out her sins each week and hand them to him instead of shouting them out. The next week, Mrs. Longworth handed the priest her list. And he looked at it, confused. What is this, said Father Duncan. It looks like a grocery list. Mrs. Longworth exclaimed, Mother of God, I must have left my sins at Safeway. <laughs> my friends, there's a better place to leave our sins. Leave them on the cross with Jesus. For it is there that God dealt with sin completely and for eternity. Leave them at the cross often. For we battle the spiritual powers of sin and evil constantly. And are constantly in danger of subtly being seduced into conforming to them. Really leave your sins at the cross and then continue living as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. Jesus knows that in this life we cannot escape the presence and the weight of sin and evil. He knows that we are fighting that battle of faith both internally and externally. And so he gives his people both a vision and a promise. God has a kingdom plan for them. A kingdom that will reflect the character and purposes, the full glory of God. And someday all sin and evil, everything that stands in opposi opposition to God, will be rightly judged and destroyed. What will be left is the unhindered glory of God shining forth from God to God's children, but with his Holy Spirit living in us, we can shine out the glory of God in all circumstances, even now. And that is the culminating message of the parable of the wheat and the weeds. Trust the present and the future to God. Help us to do this, Lord. Amen.
please stand. Let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life, life everlasting. everlasting. Amen. Amen. Confident that God receives our joys and concerns, let us offer our prayers for the church, those in need, and all of creation. O oh God, you call your church to announce the gospel of reconciliation and truth, both near and far. Guide your church as it seeks your wisdom and shares it, trusting your spirit bearing witness among us. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. great. You brought forth all creation and called it good. Direct policymakers to protect lands and seas. Bring rain to sun-parched fields and protect areas impacted by natural disasters. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. great. You desire peace among the nations and peoples. Guard our communities and neighborhoods from hatred. Watch over law enforcement officers and firefighters and teach us to advocate for those who live in fear. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. great. You are gracious and merciful, comforting those who suffer any affliction, especially Jeanette Kiki, Bobby Bredar, Charles Landaway, Doug Harmel, Barely Goldberg, Lindley Kasurik, Terry Tiemann, Deanna Solly, Linda Aberhart, Danny Riggs, Brenda Vorner, Jane Herzog, Ken Von Gotten, Michael Contreras, Paula Baker, Cindy Laws, Sandra Knox, Donna Watson, Pat Williams, Stephen Nagley, Elder Resendez, James Zappalak, and others we now name. Grant peace to those who mourn, especially the family of Glenn Spees and the family of Andre Delacroix and others we now name. And come for those who are close to death. Sustain your people living with HIV AIDS. Provide shelter for all who are unhoused and release any who are unjustly imprisoned. Hear us, O God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. great. You name each of us as your children. Guide our hospitality ministry to welcome all, our education ministry to equip us for faithful living, and our social ministry to enact the gospel in our community. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You send faithful people to proclaim freedom from bondage and to renew your church. Encourage us by the witness of the faithful departed so that we live in that same hope. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray. In the name of the one who reconciled all creation to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Now in response to God's love and grace, we bring our offering.
Let us pray. God, our Creator, you open wide your hearts, your hand, and satisfy the desire of every living creature. With these gifts, we bless you for your ten and walk in your ways. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.